Life Audio. Christian Parent Crazy World with Katherine Seegers is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Welcome to Christian Parent Crazy World, the podcast that tackles tough topics to help you be a godly parent in an ungodly world. I am your host, Katherine Seegers, and in today's episode, we will tackle this very provocative question, where did woke ideology come from and where is it going? Yep, we are wrapping up our two-part series on woke today by looking at how woke ideology proper emerged on the scene. Who were the major players and how did they get woke ideology to take root in the Western mindset? We will answer those questions and then we're going to look at where woke is going. You can see that by looking at where it is, mamas and papas. We're going to get more and more of this jujitsu Jedi mind control from an ideology that professes to liberate and all the while it is leading us into another form of bondage. And along the way, I will give you a simple, concise, easy to use definition of woke that you can share with your kids and anyone else who has ears to hear. That's the plan for this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World. So let's get started. Hey, everybody. I'm Dale. And I'm Tamara. And we're hosts of the Kynos Project podcast. Where we help you tackle ancient Christian truths in everyday settings. The word Kynos means new, and that's exactly what we want to do on our podcast. Bring something new from what is old in our faith. And on this show, you might hear us explore topics like what the Bible has to say about student loan forgiveness, discuss how the satanic temple affects our view of religious liberty in America, or even question why is it that so many people are having rapture anxiety. To learn more about the podcast, go to lifeaudio.com. The Historical Jesus Podcast is the sweeping saga of the life and times of Galilean Jesus of Nazareth as well as the faith, religion, and church founded to honor and disseminate his acts and teachings. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this fascinating journey through time, exploring the many great works of Christian theology, literature, architecture, music, and art inspired by the words and deeds of Jesus Christ. So I did get that episode with Dr. Douglas Groteis recorded on the greatest barrier to the Christian faith for the next generation. So that will be up next on CPCW, Mamas and Papas. That is such an important topic for us as parents to explore. And this is such a wonderful episode from one of the greatest Christian apologists of our day. But what you are going to love most about this interview, moms and dads, is that Dr. Groteis not only shares his mind with us, He shares his heart, his testimony. It brought me to tears. And as always, head on over to my Instagram page at at Catherine Seegers and my Facebook page at Catherine Seegers Speaker to see clips of my interviews and to receive encouraging posts and words. Uh, You Drop me a line while you're at it. You can always email me at Catherine at CatherineSeegers.com. I love hearing from my listeners. So in the last episode, I discussed the foundation that woke ideology rests on from a historical and biblical point of view. If you missed that episode, do check it out. Today's topic will make a lot more sense if you do. In a nutshell, I discussed the hierarchical, man, I am approaching pro status with the pronunciation of that word, um, hierarchical structure that we see in society time and time and time again throughout history. You know, woke ideology is very critical of this structure and rightfully so. With our fallen human nature, this structure has been ripe for abuse. But the answer isn't getting rid of the structure. No, the answer is using God's example of the king coming to earth to serve humanity. That is the way the hierarchy is supposed to work in God's kingdom. The greatest of these becomes the least of these. He or she uses their position of power not to abuse and oppress, but rather 
to serve. We see Jesus living out this example beautifully in the Gospels. Now we need to look at how woke ideology proper developed philosophically. Don't worry. I'll be gentle for those of you listening to this episode with your kids, your older kids. This won't be hard to understand. We are going to look at a good bit of history here as well so that we can really connect these dots. Some of that will be very current history as we see the disastrous effects of woke philosophy in real time. Yeah. You know, woke activists are perpetuating the very abuse that they claim to want to cure. And then we will wrap this puppy up with a spiritual conclusion on woke. But first, let's look at where woke came from. The root. In the early 1800s, a German philosopher came along who pinpointed this tendency throughout human history of society dividing itself into these classes and hierarchies. He looked at the long line of abuses by ruling classes throughout history that we examined in the last episode, and he called the ruling class the oppressors. And he showed how these oppressors demanded service from the serving class who were called the oppressed. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Yeah. His name was Karl Marx. And he wasn't wrong, at least not in the problem that he identified. As I spent the whole last episode showing, societies have been divided between oppressors and oppressed people groups since the dawn of man. Very few societies have managed to break free from this hierarchical structure historically. We will talk about who did in a moment. But it's important to point out, however, the type of man that Karl Marx was. Despite coming from comfortable homes, both Marx and his wife lived in poverty in a pigsty with seven children. Four. Gosh, this is this is just heartbreaking. Four of those children died. Many claim that it was due to these poor conditions. Some of the children died of starvation. The man insisted on philosophizing and writing. He refused to do manual labor or quote unquote honest work to save his family. He literally watched his kids die while he wrote. So when someone professes to be a Marxist, it is important to know something about the man at the center of that ideology, not a guy that I would want to model my life after. (laughs) Just saying. So Marx rightly identified oppression, the oppression implemented throughout the hierarchical structure present in virtually every society and human history. However, he wrongly identified the culprit because Marx was an atheist. He didn't recognize the evil and the heart of mankind that was causing this abuse to happen. And until you remedy that, you will continue to have this problem in every society until Jesus returns. And you can quote me on that. Marx thought if he could inspire a revolution and change the ruling regime, aka the oppressors, that he could fix the problem. At least that is what he claimed. But I would say that really all he wanted to do was replace the oppressors with a very different group of oppressors, a different group of powerful people of whom he would be one. This has happened literally everywhere Marxism has been employed. Marxists don't eradicate the world from oppression. They just change who is doing the oppression. Now, you may have heard the slogan, quote unquote, workers of the world unite. That was the original Marxist slogan. Those workers are the oppressed class of people at the bottom rung of society that he was trying to coalesce in order to create a revolution. And it worked sort of for a while. Those oppressed people groups had very poor working conditions and they were starving. And so they demanded change. The problem for Marx was when they got a little bit of change enough to live on and survive, they really didn't want to be pawns in his scheme to start a revolution anymore. They didn't want to be at war. They wanted to live with their families and their homes quietly and peacefully so that he stopped fighting. The workers, the quote unquote oppressed people group, didn't stay united to fully realize the revolution that Marx wanted because they weren't so oppressed anymore. So what happened? 
Well, around that time, it was around World War II, Marxism needed to reinvent itself because the revolution wasn't happening. That was the primary problem that the School of Marxism in Frankfurt, Germany, also known as the Frankfurt School, was trying to solve in the 1940s. Around the same time, Hitler came to power and the Marxists had to flee because Marxists and fascists are both abusive totalitarian forms of power, but they don't play very well together. So some of these Marxist revolutionaries came to the United States and were seated in our educational system. They started at Columbia University. They were hired there. And then they spread to all of these other colleges and universities. Higher education in the United States has been a breeding ground of Marxist ideology in the U.S. for like the past 80 years. You remember what Jesus said about a little leaven, leavening the whole lump of dough. Yeah. mm -hmm. So that happened in our colleges and universities. But these Marxist revolutionaries realized that the old workers, the peasants at the bottom rung of society, weren't going to fight for the revolution they wanted. They, They were too comfortable in the West. They needed a new group of workers. And a guy by the name of Max Horkheimer had a brilliant idea. Eureka. Yeah, he realized that in order for the revolution to happen, you had to tear down certain Western institutions. You couldn't have a Marxist revolution in a country that professed individual freedom and stood on the principle of religious liberty and had a bedrock of the nuclear family and had a free press and law enforcement rooted in the idea of blind justice. These these institutions had to come down for Marxism to prevail. But how could they tear them down? Horkheimer had a brilliant answer, a brilliant idea, criticism. Yeah, if you relentlessly criticize these institutions over and over and over, eventually they will fall. This is the basis of what is called critical theory. You may have heard of it. It was invented by Max Horkheimer. That morphed into various forms of critical theory, like critical legal theory and then critical race theory, also known as CRT, and then critical gender theory. All of these critical theories are rooted in Marxist ideology. You can destroy something by criticizing it over and over and over. Now, just ask yourself, Who uses relentless criticism to tear things down and make change? God or his counterpart? Mm Mm-hmm. You know the answer to that question. Hey, everybody. I'm Dale. And I'm Tamara. We're hosts of the Kainos Project podcast. Where we help you tackle ancient Christian truths in everyday settings. To learn more and subscribe, go to lifeaudio.com. So in order to relentlessly criticize these Western institutions, the neo-Marxist ideologues slash activists slash revolutionaries would need a new group of workers. The old workers wouldn't work for the revolution anymore because it turns out banding together and insisting on better working conditions got the results they were looking for. So the new Marxists needed a new group of oppressed people, and they looked around and thought, hmm, 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 who could that be? And they accurately realized that certain races weren't treated the way that they should be in the United States in that era of history or anywhere else in the world, for that matter. A fact that so many modern, woke or progressive ideologues or historians overlook or ignore. Remember, this was back in the 40s, 50s and 60s. Okay, yeah, there was prejudice and sexism and misogyny and racism in the world still is. But yes, women and black people and other minorities, especially back then, were marginalized and oppressed during that era of history and prior to that in the United States and other Western nations. Still are in many Middle and Far Eastern nations today, tragically. But we must remember that wasn't a reality unique to the United States or even the West. Every nation had the egregious sins of prejudice and racism and sexism and slavery since the dawn of man, right? We covered that in the last episode because the problem isn't the institutions of the family and faith and law enforcement and the legal system or the media. Well, 
maybe the media. <laughs> okay, kind of kind of joking there. Not really. Uh, the problem is in the hearts of the people running those institutions. Okay, so what happened? Horkheimer and other critical theorists like Herbert Marcuse and eventually Derek Bell and Richard Delgado and Kimberly Crenshaw came along and helped to spread the idea of critical theory by relentlessly criticizing all of our Western institutions. Now, Herbert Marcuse, who I just mentioned, was one of the original German refugees from the School of Marxism in Frankfurt, Germany. He became one of those academics seated at Columbia University in the 1930s when Nazism took over in Germany. He later taught at Brandeis University and the University of California in San Diego. This guy made the rounds. Now, this guy, Marcuse, was huge in reinventing Marxism through critical theory. He took the ball that Horkheimer created with CT and ran with it. Marcuse wrote a book in 1964. It was a seminal work called One Dimensional Man, which argued that free market or capitalistic ideas had made the Western man into a one dimensional creature who was unaware of his own oppression. The fruits of capitalism had lulled him to sleep and he didn't realize that he was actually a victim. So the Western man needed an awakening to this system of control. In other words, he needed to be woke. <laughs> That's what woke is. An awakening to our oppression from these Western institutions and all this criticism from critical theory is supposed to wake us up. And what do us Westerners need to be woke to exactly? Well, another communist Marxist leader tells us. Now, I find this fascinating. The leader of the Italian Communist Party back in 1924, a guy by the name of Antonio Gramsci. I'd like to say that with an Antonio Gramsci. Yeah, that's how you do that. Antonio Gramsci identified five pillars of Western society that would have to fall in order for a communist, you know, Marxist revolution to take place. Quick side note, communism is the full implementation of Marxist ideology within a governmental structure. OK, so Gramsci, who led the Communist Party in Italy, specifically identified five institutions of Western civilization that would have to be destroyed in order for Marxism to succeed. They are the family, religion the media, law or the legal system, and education. Mm. <laughs> okay, hello. This is exactly what woke activists are trying to destroy today, right? Like, okay, Black Lives Matter, which you probably know is a Marxist organization, had the disruption of the nuclear family as a stated goal on their website. I saw it. That is until people looked at that goal and said, um, wait a second, you want to disrupt or destroy the nuclear family? I'm not really on board with that. I, and, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. So they took it down. OK, yeah. But ask yourself this. What is woke ideology criticizing now? The nuclear family, our legal system and law enforcement, you know, like defund the police. Right. Uh, they pretty much control the media. Um. Uh, you know, the media only criticizes those who dissent now. And, and of course, they're criticizing any form of religion that is not progressive or on board with woke ideas. And they have infiltrated our educational system. Are you connecting the dots here? You know, I hope so. All of this criticism is calculated. Critical theory and all of its iterations are strategically aimed at the five pillars of Western society that Antonio Gramsci, a militant Marxist philosopher and activist, identified. They know what institutions have to fall for neo or new Marxism to take hold in the West. I hope this is, this is making sense to you. I hope the dots are connecting here. So, these new Marxist woke activists united all of these marginalized groups who were at one point, you know, genuinely oppressed people to become their new workers. It wasn't hard because many of them had real grievances, especially 40, 50, 60 years ago. If you could point the blame 
to these Western institutions as the culprit, if you if you could make them think that the real problem was the institution and not the people in charge of the institutions, then these oppressed people groups would become your new revolutionary workers and they wouldn't even know it from Mm -hmm. Honestly, I have to say, uh, it's a brilliant idea, brilliant plan. You don't even have to explain how the revolution will fix the problem, which is a good thing because it won't. Nor do you have to explain how these institutions are at fault because they aren't. Most people won't scratch that deep. They'll just criticize over and over and over. Criticism is contagious. Why do you think God talks so much about the grumbling and complaining with the Israelites back in the Old Testament? It's contagious. You you criticize the family, criticize freedom of speech, criticize religious faith, criticize law enforcement, criticize the Bill of Rights, criticize education, criticize biological reality because it is oppressive to believe in just two genders. And these institutional structures will Fall, London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. And let me be clear. Look, you know, I'm not saying that all of these institutions are pure. They aren't because the people who run them aren't pure. But is the problem the people who run them or the people who have run them in the past? Or is the problem the institution itself? You know, we need to be very clear on the answer to that question before we start tearing down the institutions. That is what neo-Marxist woke ideologues are doing today without explaining how they will fix the problem. So to give you the promise, simple and concise definition of what woke is, woke is Marxist ideology repackaged with new revolutionary workers. It's Marxism 2.0. It is this accurate idea that society has always and frankly, without God, always will divide itself into these hierarchies that are oppressive. At the top are oppressors and at the bottom are oppressed people. That is the definition, folks. That's it in a nutshell. But what woke ideologues and activists really want to do is change the group of oppressors at the top. They want to create a new group of oppressed people. That's quite a claim, I know. But how do we know this? Because (laughs) they're already doing it. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples here, okay? Perhaps you heard recently of the conservative male federal judge who was invited to speak at Stanford University Law School. Judge Kyle Duncan showed up to speak and he was silenced. He was heckled by a mob of woke students and he was ambushed by the dean of equity who accused the judge of harming students with his speech. (laughs) This is a federal judge, mind you. They had to shut him down. He was like the Dalits from India that I talked about in the last episode. That is the lowest group of people in the Indian caste system. He had to be canceled. He was untouchable. Moms and dads, that is cult-like behavior. When you have to silence someone who disagrees with you, when you won't even let them speak, you don't have a powerful argument. That is what woke activists are doing with people who dare to speak up for women in sports. Riley Gaines has been pummeled in the press and in person for daring to speak up for female athletes, for insisting that biological women should have a level playing ground in sports. They should not have their medals and scholarships stolen by biological males. And she was heckled, screamed at, and ambushed by a mob at San Francisco State University a couple of months ago for daring to express that opinion. She was hit multiple times by a guy in a dress. Now, Riley was terrified as the mom closed in on her. She had to barricade herself in a room for three hours. There were no arrests, by the way. If you don't have the right ideas, if you express ideas outside of the approved woke narrative, then you will be silenced with force if necessary. Mamas and papas, we have progressed far past mere criticism. They can't win the argument, so they have to end the argument. Yeah, that is how woke operates. 
But this woke biological unreality, which is really a new hierarchy, isn't just unfair. It isn't just stealing women's podiums and scholarships and opportunities that they worked years for. It is dangerous. Just ask Peyton McNabb, a high school volleyball player that was permanently injured by a transgendered athlete. Now, in volleyball, men have higher nets because it prevents them from being able to hurt other players when they spike the ball. They're, you know, much stronger and they have to have higher nets in order to protect the players. Well, Peyton was really nervous, as were her teammates, about playing against a biological male with the shorter nets women have in volleyball. Turns out her fears were very well-founded. Peyton was on the receiving end of a blistering, blistering spiked ball from this biological male who was a transgendered female athlete. And that spiked ball knocked her out cold. She got a concussion and was permanently injured. She has impaired vision, partial paralysis on her right side, chronic headaches. It it has affected her cognitive function as school as well. It's it's also caused severe anxiety and depression, as you can imagine. Peyton hasn't been able to play volleyball again since that happened. And by the way, while this poor child was knocked out cold on the floor for a half a minute, this trans athlete and the opposing team were laughing at her, laughing. You know, I'll post a link to her interview with Megan Kelly. You you can see the video of the spike ball. It is heartbreaking. That's where we are, mamas and papas. Talk about a new kind of oppressive hierarchy in history. Seriously, we're there. Woke ideology tells you that men and women are the same and they can compete on a level playing field. Clearly, they can. And if you need more proof of that fact, if you need some ammunition, consider Serena Williams, arguably the best female tennis player of all time. She has dominated the sport for decades. She is one of the best female athletes of all time. She's like the Michael Jordan or the Wayne Gretzky of women's tennis. She was beaten by the 203rd best male tennis player in the world. It wasn't even close. She was like beaten six to one. In a set, okay, six games to one. The best female tennis player of all time could make it into the top 200 of male players. And if you point that out, like Riley Gaines does, they will scream at you, hit you, and barricade you in a room for three hours. But what is happening to women in sports isn't the most serious problem with woke ideology. It is the transitioning of children from one sex to the other. You guys know this. It is the idea that you can change the sex you were born with and that young children who aren't even old enough to get an alcoholic beverage should be cutting off their body parts and rendering themselves sterile for life in an effort to be what they can never be. Christians have been very vocal about this danger and have been deemed anti-trans by the woke army. Did you hear Tony Award-winning actress and woke activist Patti LuPone recently compare Christians to the Taliban? Hmm? Christians in the United States who oppose children transitioning to the opposite sex, i.e. being chemically and physically castrated or having their breasts cut off, are just like the Taliban, she claimed. Okay, so I just have to ask, what planes have we flown into buildings What people have we beheaded? What women have we mutilated? What children have we kidnapped and raped? (laughs) Lapone can't point to any. And yet, she said, we are just like the Taliban. And Whoopi Goldberg, who she was in an interview with, said in response, "Uh, well, you know, you're not the first person to say that. (laughs) No pushback, uh, no questions, no accurate identification of our concerns for children making irrevocable decisions with their bodies, just tacit agreement. How can Lapone say that and get away with it? How can Whoopi agree? How can Riley Gaines be ambushed for supporting women in sports? And how can Judge Kyle Duncan be humiliated in silence? Well, because according to new woke ideology, words are violent and you can inflict violence on someone by telling them that God has a design for their sexuality, and you are perfect the way 
that you were born, and we don't think that children should be cutting off their breasts and their penises or rendering themselves sterile for life. That makes us like the Taliban, according to woke ideology. And we must be silenced because we are terrorists. <sighs> yeah, I, mean, I know. I know this stuff is hard, moms and dads, but we have got to recognize where this is coming from. We have got to connect the dots for ourselves and for our kids. Woke ideology claims to want to get rid of oppression, but as you can see, oppression is the way they operate. They marginalize, vilify, silence, and oppress anyone who disagrees with them. They don't want a conversation. And let's be honest again, there have been God followers throughout history and even now who operate that same way. The Pharisees certainly did, and some Christians have done that throughout history and and today. It's wrong. It's wrong when they do it, and it's wrong when we do it. The truth we speak must come from a place of love. It has to, or it won't accomplish anything. Now, for just a a few minutes here, I want to look at this topic of woke from a spiritual perspective. I did a worldview series early on on CPCW. I think it was episodes like six through nine. I'll link it in the show notes. If if you want to really dig more deeply into how the Christian worldview liberates us, you've got to check that out. Now, the last episode in that series was titled, How the Christian Worldview Creates the World We All Want to Live in. And I talked about how it was the Christian worldview through abolitionists like William Wilberforce that eradicated slavery in the West. It wasn't an atheist worldview, which Karl Marx espoused, or a pantheistic worldview, or even a pluralistic worldview. It certainly wasn't a woke worldview. It was the Christian worldview. It was no coincidence that Martin Luther King Jr. was a minister. And, and many of the early feminists who were nothing like modern day secular feminists were Quakers, Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott. And they were ardent abolitionists as well. They fought for justice because the Christian worldview, Christ himself, compelled them to. The West broke free from the oppressive hierarchical structure through Christian liberators like Wilberforce and MLK Jr. and Anthony and Mott. Liberation is at the heart of the gospel message for all people. How are we liberated? Truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's John 8, 32. Those are red letter words from Jesus himself. We are liberated by truth. The truth of our equality in Christ is what led to the abolition of slavery in the West. The truth of our equality in Christ is what led women to fight for higher education and equal pay and the right to own and inherit property, the right to vote, the right to speak in public forums. The arc of human history is one that goes from bondage to freedom. This is the message of scripture. Sin binds us But Jesus sets us free. But we must take great care that our freedom doesn't lead us to another bondage. That is precisely what woke ideology will do. It's what it is doing. It is leading us to another bondage. The Christian faith, when rightly applied, and let's acknowledge that it hasn't always been rightly applied, but the Christian faith wants to liberate Everyone, not forcefully. We we don't want to force people to believe the Christian faith, nor do we want to silence them like woke ideologues want to do to opposing ideas. Let me be clear. I think woke ideology is extremely dangerous, and they think that Christian ideology is extremely dangerous. But I don't want to silence them like they do us. I have full faith that the Christian worldview, when properly presented, will vindicate itself. It can stand up to honest scrutiny. I believe that the truth we espouse can and will set people free. Which begs the question, why does woke ideology have to silence the opposition? 
Why does it have to bully and criticize and cancel and hit and spike balls in our faces? Does that sound like an ideology that can stand up to honest scrutiny? I don't I don't think so. Bullies bully because that is the only way they can win. That is the only way they can rule. They can't convince people of their cause because they don't have superior ideas. Woke is operating by the same might makes right philosophy that has ruled hierarchies since the fall. They claim to want to liberate, but the only liberty they offer is to live within the very narrow confines of their oppressive ideology. Truth is what sets us free, mamas and papas. If we accept that truth, it will liberate us, regardless of what physical freedoms are taken away on this earth, regardless of who people compare us to, regardless of what people say about us and do to us. The truth will set us free. (sighs) Well, You know, I hope this aerial view of woke ideology has helped you connect the dots. Might I recommend having your older kids, maybe if you have adult kids, give this episode a listen and the last episode. And if you want to dig deeper into woke ideology, I will link some resources for you in the show notes. But I do need to give like a shout out to two other podcasts for helping me to learn so much about the history of of woke red pilled america is a fascinating podcast it did a five-part series on the woke army if you are looking for a deep dive into the history of woke look no further that is it red pilled america actually utilizes original audio material from the actual people they report on it is it is fascinating to hear these people espouse their ideas in their own Words. Now, a uh, quick note here. After their podcasts have been out for a while, they are archived and you have to be a paid subscriber to access that material. And that series came out a while back and has been behind their paywall for some time now. But get this. <laughs> they just re-released it in honor of the 100-year anniversary of the Frankfurt School. What? better way to honor the original school of Marxism than to educate people on exactly what it is and why it is so dangerous. So you want to get that one while the getting's good, mamas and papas. It will go behind their paywall again. And I personally think it's positively providential that they just re-released it to coincide with this episode. Thank you, Lord. Another incredible resource is Liz Wheeler, who has done some amazing podcasts on woke ideology, really digging into the history as well. Her interviews with Dr. James Lindsay are among the best I have ever heard. I I don't know that anyone understands wokeism quite like Dr. Lindsay. I'm going to link those podcasts for you in the show notes on Life Audio and on my website as well. Lord, help us to identify this false ideology when we see it. Help us to educate our kids on what woke is. And please anoint, oh God, anoint this next generation to receive the truth so that they can walk in freedom. I want to thank you for joining me today. Look, I know there are a lot of things you could be listening to right now, and I really appreciate that you took this time to spend with me. I hope you will join me for my next podcast when we take aim at some aspect of our culture that threatens to derail our parenting and steal our kids' faith. If you enjoyed this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World, would you consider telling a friend and sharing it on social media and giving it a good review over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and following me on Facebook and Instagram? Oh, oh, and maybe you could say that Christian Parent Crazy World is the best podcast you've ever heard in your entire life. uh, Just a thought. Uh, And be sure to check out my website, which is katherinesegers.com. That's Catherine with a C. I have lots of articles and resources there that will help you on your parenting journey. And if you subscribe, I will be sure to send you some really cool free stuff and notify you of future podcasts, articles, and blogs. I want to end this and every episode with a word of encouragement. God gave you 
your kids, your specific kids for a reason. That's because you hold the key to unlocking who God created them to be. We'll see you next time. Christian Parent Crazy World is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Hey friend, do you ever feel like the busyness of life makes it hard to slow down and truly connect with Jesus? Do your priorities and passions feel jumbled and out of whack? Then join me this summer on my podcast, How to Study the Bible, as we dive into Spiritual Rhythms, a six-week series that will lead us through six spiritual rhythms to help us slow down and make space for Jesus in the busyness of everyday life. To guide us, I've put together a free downloadable six-week study available at NicoleEunice.com slash spiritual practices. The study will walk us through God's word as we learn to embrace daily practices that draw us closer to Jesus. Each week on the podcast, we'll walk through one spiritual rhythm that helps us discover how to spend intentional time with God, align our passions and balance our priorities, and make time and space for restfulness and celebration. Download Spiritual Rhythms for free today at NicoleEunice.com slash spiritual practices, and I'll see you on how to say the Bible.